Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for tuning in again. So in this video, I'm going to cover diseases of the circulatory and lymphatic systems. So uh, we'll start real quick with a reminder about the anatomy of these systems. So one of the things that you can notice from these, these figures is that the circulatory and the lymphatic system are made up of a series of vessels. So with the cardiovascular system, you're going to have uh, arteries and veins and then capillaries that are going to distribute nutrients, um, remove carbon dioxide, bring oxygen to those tissues. Um, and then with the lymphatic system, you kind of have a series of lymphatic vessels that basically mirror the cardiovascular system and provide access to the tissues for our immune cells. Um, they provide a way for things that are leaving our tissues to sort of run off. It's a way that fluid can be recirculated back into our bloodstream and uh, harmful things like pathogens and other things that shouldn't be in our body can get removed. Um, but what you can see here is these systems uh, spread throughout our entire body. So there are our blood vessels throughout our entire body. There are lymph, uh, lymphatic vessels throughout our entire body. And as you can imagine, when you end up getting an infection that gains access to these spaces, you now have infections that can gain access to pretty much the entirety of our body. Uh, so that's why we're going to have a major problem uh, if we end up in a scenario where an infection has made it into either or both of these systems. Uh, so we're going to start with bacterial infections of these two systems. Uh, and the first thing we'll talk about is bacterial sepsis and septic shock. All right. So when we talk about bacterial sepsis, what we're talking about is the presence of bacterial pathogens at relatively high levels in the bloodstream. They're not just sort of there passing through, they're there, they're living there, they're dividing, they're causing issues. Um, and one of the consequences to this is that your body's going to respond to this. You do have uh, white blood cells out there that are gonna start targeting these things. And what happens is once they recognize that there's a problem, uh, once they recognize that there's something in the blood vessels that shouldn't be there, you end up in a scenario where they're going to start secreting a large amount of these pro-inflammatory cytokine, cytokines, uh, things like interleukin-1 or tissue necrosis factor alpha. And once those begin circulating in the bloodstream, um, you end up having, an, an, the, the body basically starts to shut down. Uh, you're going to end up watching the blood pressure begin to plummet. You're going to end up with widespread vasodilation uh, and inflammation, and this is going to cause leaking of the blood vessels into the tissues, hence the drop in the blood pressure. And this is a potentially uh, fatal condition if it's not treated very, very promptly. Um, usually, when things gain access to the bloodstream, it's going to start as the result of a localized minor infection that gets out of hand. And that's why sometimes even minor wounds, minor infections, things like that, they need to be addressed relatively quickly because depending on which pathogen it is, it can cause a life-threatening condition fairly rapidly. In terms of the most common causative agents, and I should be clear, um, when it comes to these, uh, there are lots of different things. Like it's not good to really have any type of bacteria in the bloodstream. This is one of those areas where we don't have a normal microbiota. We don't have things normally living in our bloodstream that don't belong to us. But the most common causative agents are gonna be Staphylococcus species, Streptococcus species, uh, Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, uh, Pasteurella species, and Acinetobacter species. Those are the most common ones we find in cases of of sepsis and septic shock. Uh, in terms of how we describe these, Staphylococcus, they're all gram-positive Staphylococcus species. Streptococcus, no shock there, gram-positive Streptococcus species. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we've encountered before, but that's a gram-negative rod. Pastorella species, um, are gram negative pleomorphic. So when you see the term pleomorphic, it means they don't really have a defined shape. They can appear as rods, they can appear as cocci, they can appear as these long, these sort of long elongated structures. Uh, they can they, they kind of get weird looking. They don't have a really defined shape. Uh, and then acinetobacter, they're gram negative cocobacillus. So they're still considered rods, but they're just shorter. They look almost a bit like footballs. Uh, signs of sepsis uh, are going to be, uh, in septic shock, uh, very low blood pressure. Uh, this is highly problematic. Uh, with low blood pressure, it means your the oxygen and things aren't circulating like they need to. Uh, there could be pain. Uh, a big indicator here is the fever or hypothermia. It can go either way depending on how it's manifesting. So you might get a very high fever or you might end up in hypothermia. Either way, shaking and chills are going to happen. 
um, because of all the antigen, uh, the antibodies and, and all that stuff going around, you could end up with blood clots. Uh, tachycardia is common in, in any type of shock. The heart rate increases to compensate for that low blood pressure. This is also going to go with rapid breathing because your body is sensing that oxygen is not circulating appropriately. Actually, technically, physiologically speaking, your body is sensing that carbon dioxide is not being removed efficiently, um, but your body is going to increase breathing in an effort to get rid of that carbon dioxide and bring in the oxygen. Uh, skin is going to feel cool. It's going to appear pale or it could appear mottled, which is like pale white with like, like red sort of like, um, like patches in it. Um, heart palpitations are common. Uh, the, uh, a person who's doing this probably going to have little to no urine output if they're going into shock because their body's shutting down. Um, and of course they're going to be disoriented and confused because they're not getting enough oxygen to their brain and tissues like that. Um, in terms of transmission, as I mentioned before, sepsis, septic shock are usually the result of an existing infection. It's very rare that you just get an infection in your bloodstream. Uh, very often it starts somewhere else, migrates there. Uh, the way you're going to diagnose this is you're going to take a blood culture and you're going to look for the presence of bacteria. As a reminder, there should not be bacteria in your bloodstream. There's no healthy, normal microbiota out there. Um, prevention, well, there really is none. I guess if you want to say any, it's prompt treatment of an existing infection, but sometimes you might not even know that the infection is there. Uh, treatment, antibiotics. Um, and this is not something that you're gonna wanna wait. Usually this is something that you'll start with broad spectrum antibiotics. And then once you've identified the specific causative agent, you may change course depending on how effective your current course is. In terms of complication, organ failure. Uh, again, and once it's in the bloodstream, it's gonna have access to pretty much any organ in your body um, and can be, and it can begin to impact those systems as well. Uh, so organ failure is ob obviously potentially fatal. Gangrene, so if you get those blood clots and it blocks blood flow, uh, those tissues are going to die and they're going to need to be removed uh, or death. Um, and septic shock is, is absolutely, uh, is absolutely fatal if left untreated. Something similar is toxic shock syndrome. So toxic shock syndrome is usually the result of either Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes. Um, I don't think there's a single video that I'll be doing in this series where these two aren't mentioned at least once. So gram positive Staphylococcus in the, in the case of Staph aureus and a gram positive Streptococcus in the case of Strep pyogenes. Signs and symptoms of this, vomiting, diarrhea, pain, a high fever is common, and again, low blood pressure. Uh, this is a shock syndrome. So when we're talking shock, don't be surprised. Low blood pressure is, uh, is a sign of almost all kinds of shock um, and rash. Uh, they might get a rash in their body uh, depending on uh, where the affected area is. This is, again, is usually the result of localized or systemic infections, but actually the most common cause that we see now is uh, often the use of uh, leaving tampons, sponges, diaphragms, et cetera, in the vagina for too long. Uh, they can stay there and this can result in um, the overgrowth of these two dangerous species of bacteria in the wrong place. Um, the way we diagnose this, blood or urine cultures to detect the presence of either Staph aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes. You could also do tissue cultures uh, depending on the affected area. There really is no prevention. Um, if you any box of feminine care products uh, or any sort of uh, you know implanted device uh, that is used for reproductive care, such as sponges, diaphragms, they all have warnings on them to warn you that toxic shock can occur if these things are are left in for too long, not treated appropriately. Uh, the treatment, antibiotics, um, sometimes they use immunoglobulin treatment and then debridement, which is essentially the cutting away of dead tissue. So if, if tissues begin to become necrotic, they're going to have to get removed. Otherwise, you risk the spread of the disease to other parts of the body. If left untreated, organ failure is a common outcome and as well as uh, as well as death. Uh, this, is a, this is a life threatening condition as it can impact uh, multiple body systems. Osteomyelitis is actually an infection of the bone, um, and there are several causative agents for this. Uh, the most common far and away is Staphylococcus aureus, and here we go again with Streptococcus pyogenes. It always seems like where Staphylococcus aureus goes, Streptococcus pyogenes is not too far behind. Um, but this can also be a result of a disseminated infection of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I, I do another video uh, where I talk about tuberculosis and that it can disseminate and cause all kinds of problems. 
One of those is osteomyelitis. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Streptococcus agalactii can also cause these as well. Um, and you can see the causative agents, the description of the causative agents listed here. Uh, these, like I said, are, are covered. <laughs> A lot of these guys come back in every video. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is another one uh, that comes back, but those are the descriptions right there. In terms of signs and symptoms, um, you're going to have fever and chills. This is an infection that this is a systemic infection. And for pretty much all of the infections you see in this video, you're going to find fever and chills, right? This is a widespread problem, but you'll also have localized pain. And that localized pain is going to be at the area of the infected bone, as are the redness and swelling. You may also, also get ulcerative skin lesions uh, in the area. And if the bone is infected, you're going to get a, a change in the mobility of that affected limb, right? You're, if you if you have a toe bone, for example, that's got us that is infected, it's going to hurt like heck when you try to put pressure uh, or weight on that particular toe. Uh, transmission usually this is the result of some type of trauma, but can also be be the result of a surgical procedure. Again, this is going to you're going to need to get access to these bacteria are going to need to get access to these tissues which are localized deep in our body. Uh, but it's also possible that the bacteria can spread from spread from the bloodstream. So if you end up with sepsis, it can make it into the into the bone as well and cause issues. To diagnose this, you're going to want to do blood and bone cultures. So uh, draw some blood, see if there's anything in the bloodstream, and then you're going to want to go to the affected bone and, and get cultures there. You may also uh, use radiography. Um, so you can see uh, on these radiograms down here, you can see this, obviously, with the photos, you can see how infected this particular portion of the foot is. But if you look at the level in the x-rays, you can see the damage of the bone. And you can even see like that overgrowth of the bone that that's basically like scar tissue buildup essentially as a result of that infection. Uh, prevention, there really is none. Uh, treatments, antibiotics are common. Sometimes they use hyperbaric oxygen uh, that, that has a way of um, uh, putting more oxygen there affects um, particularly anaerobic species at times. And it's also been shown to help wound healing in some cases. Uh, complications, they may have to do surgery and they may have to remove infected tissue, which means you could lose, potentially lose um, digits, limbs, uh, or have permanent scarring as a result. Okay, next up on the list is rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever is caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. So uh, as I mentioned in a previous video uh, where we talk about bacterial pharyngitis, so this is in my uh, infections of the respiratory system, I talk a bit about Streptococcus pyogenes and Streptococcal species in general, and basically say like, if you don't treat these Streptococcal infections, they can cause problems um, later on in life, uh, if they remain in the body. And, and this is one of those cases. So streptococcus pyogenes is a very common causative agent for a lot of different infections. We've just talked about two or three today. Um, but it's also a common cause of upper respiratory infections like strep throat. Um, and if it's left untreated, it can begin to spread to, uh, begin to spread to the heart. And that's what happens in the case of rheumatic fever. So, uh, signs and symptoms of this, you'll have swollen and tender joints, uh, fever, muscle aches, headaches, exhaustion. Um, and the way that people get this is by having a, an untreated or a poorly treated streptococcal infection, uh, to test for this, uh, throat culture. So did they have bacterial pharyngitis? If, if that's the case, then you'll probably find strep pio, uh, in their throat culture. If not, you may have to do blood tests or heart tests to detect the presence of, of streptococcus pyogenes in these areas to prevent this. You need to make sure that you take all of the, um, you need to take all of the medication that's been given to you. So if you have strep throat and you're given a 10 day course of something like azithromycin, you need to take it all the way through. Uh, because if you don't, there's a possibility for some of these guys to remain in your body and then cause an infection. Like I said, if you don't get rid of streptococcus, it's eventually going to make its way to eating your heart. And indeed, um, you know, some of the things you might see, you get those painful joints, you've got that itchy, that non itchy sort of rash across the body. And you might actually detect a heart murmur, um, Whereas it, and one of the things it often targets is that mitral valve uh, in your heart. Treatment, antibiotics, but you might also need anti-inflammatory therapy. This is going to get rid of like the rash. It can help with the pain in the joints and maybe reduce the inflammation uh, in the heart as well. Uh, and complications, if it does get to that mitral valve, it does do some real damage there. You might have permanent heart damage. And one of the problems with damage to the heart is that's one of the few tissues in your body that doesn't regenerate uh, to a certain extent. So cardiomyocytes, as well as most uh, nervous system tissues do not undergo mitosis after development is complete. So any damaged heart cells just remain damaged and uh, there may need to be 
heart surgery, valve replacements, that kind of stuff uh, to fix the issue if the if rheumatic fever progresses too far. Another very serious infection of the heart is endocarditis. Um, and you can see like right here in this photo, this is what these bacterial vegetations actually look like. These, this is parts of a heart that are just completely taken over, uh, by bacteria. So endocarditis is an infection directly of the heart tissue. Um, again, this is one of those things where, uh, a lot of different species can cause issues. Uh, but what I provided you here are the big seven. These are the ones that, um, very commonly cause, um, endocarditis. So the most common, again, far and away, Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, if that gets in the bloodstream, it's really no good. It can cause major issues. Streptococcus pyogenes can also cause this. Endocarditis, again, is another potential consequence of uh, an untreated streptococcal infection. Several Haemophilus species can cause this, like Haemophilus influenzae. Uh, there's also Actinobacillus actomycetum comitans. Um, that's a very hard word to say. <laughs> Uh, actinomycetum comitans is how you pronounce that. I probably wouldn't ask a student <laughs> to, to say that. Uh, um, we also have Cardiobacterium hominis, Iconella carodens, and Kingella kingi. Uh, these are the major ones. Um, so Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pyogenes, we've met these over and over again. The rest of those species are all gram-negative rods that can cause this. Signs and symptoms. Uh, one little neat mnemonic uh, that people come up with uh, to remember this. It's called from Jane. Uh, so fever, Roth spots, Osler's nose, heart murmur, Janeway lesions, anemia, nail bed hemorrhages, and MOI. Those are the signs and symptoms. Um, and in fact, sometimes people come in with symptoms that mimic a heart attack. And really it's endocarditis because some of these things uh, overlap a little bit. But there are things that you're going to see with endocarditis that you're not going to see in a patient that's having a heart attack. High fever. People that are having a heart attack do not have a high fever. In fact, they're cool and clammy uh, because the blood is not circulating very well. Um, you may end up with Roth spots. Uh, I have a picture of those in a little bit. Uh, those are actually spots in the eye. Osler's nodes are these uh, small little uh, uh, like swellings on the hand. Uh, heart murmur, Janeway lesions. These are uh, like little uh, like like blister-like bumps on, on the feet and the hands, uh, anemia, which is a, re a reduction of iron, uh, nail bed hemorrhages, and emboli, um, which are like these like clots and stuff uh, are very common here. Uh, to diagnose this, you'll, you're going to want to do blood cultures. You're also going to do an echocardiogram. You want to see what the heart's doing. It's going to be behaving erratically because it's infected. Uh, but if you've got these from Jane clinical symptoms, that's usually a very good indicator of what you're looking at when a patient comes in. Uh, this is going to come from endogenous bacteria in many cases, um, and very often endocarditis is the result of either dental or other invasive medical procedures. Uh, there is a reason if you if you have a root canal, if you have a tooth removed, or you have any other sort of dental procedures, they're almost always going to put you on prophylactic antibiotics because um, your mouth for is is highly highly. Uh, vascularized, meaning there's a lot of direct access to the bloodstream there. And as we've learned in, in previous videos, um, you have a lot of normal microbiota that's just in your mouth, in your oral pharynx, nasal pharynx, and they're fine there. Uh, but it's when you give them direct access to the bloodstream that they cause an issue. So uh, treatment for this, more antibiotics. Uh, so we're going to want to get rid of this as soon as possible. And you're also, there's also the possibility that uh, heart surgery is going to be needed. You've got to cut away that infected tissue and repair any damage that is caused. Um, complications, permanent heart damage. Uh, again, those cardiomyocytes, they do not grow back. So if they get damaged, they're just, it is what it is. Uh, and if it's not treated or if the treatment is, is not sufficient, people are probably going to die from this. You need your heart. And if it's not functioning and it can't pump blood, then you're probably going to die. So uh, moving away from the heart, let's talk about um, gas gangrene. So gas gangrene is caused by a gram-positive rod called Clostridium perfringens. So Clostridium species um, are, are anaerobes. They, they, don't, they don't love uh, to be around. So quite often, they will actually form, uh, form endospores in aerobic environments. Great example would be like... Uh, uh, Clostridium tetani or Clostridium botulinum. But in the case of Clostridium perfringens, uh, Clostridium perfringens, same thing. So uh, when this gets into your body, uh, typically it's going to get in through trauma, 
uh, or something like a medical condition that can result in ischemia and also, you know, damage the tissue, preventing this from getting in. Um, signs and symptoms, there's going to be an extreme pain because this is going to uh, affect the deep tissues. You're going to get the death of muscle tissue, which is extraordinarily painful. Um, the wound is going to be foul smelling and contain gas bubbles. This is a result of the anaerobic metabolism, uh, that is being performed by these clostridium species. Uh, you'll also notice edema, which is swelling, uh, cutaneous blisters containing purplish blue fluids. So you can kind of see that here. There are also some, uh, I'll show you a pretty grotesque picture on the next slide of how bad this can actually look. Um, and diagnosis, uh, this is going to be uh, gangrene is a clinical diagnosis. You don't need to like, Hey, that's, that's doctor. Dying. That's a whole limb that's dying right there. So here's that picture I was talking about. And these are these black bullae, uh, as they call them, that are forming. And this is tissue that is extraordinarily necrotic and dying. Um, there's really no way to prevent this, um, but there is a way to treat it. So obviously antibiotics, this is something that is going to go system wide. You need antibiotics to prevent the spread. But the other thing that's going to happen is these surgeons are getting ready to remove that dead tissue. Um, and as a result, this could mean the loss of limbs. This could result in the loss of digits. This could result in permanent scarring and disfigurement as a result. Uh, if this continues to progress, septic shock is going to occur and that's going to be fatal. So if this takes over, um, it's going to be fatal. Uh, another systemic infection caused by bacteria is uh, a disease called tularemia. So tularemia is the result of a gram-negative coccobacillus called Francisella tularensis. It's actually an intracellular bacterium. You can see uh, this is an electron micrograph. It's false colored. They're not really blue, um, but it's showing just one of these sort of um, like clusters of Francisella tularensis inside of a tissue. Uh, signs and symptoms. So you're going to see uh, granulomas begin forming in the liver and spleen, but you are also going to see skin lesions um, at the site of the infection. Uh, fever, chills, headache, and extremely painful swollen lymph nodes. Uh, to diagnose this, you're going to want to do serology to test this. Now, transmission of this is, is, is this is actually one of, the most infectious diseases on the planet. I, it's infectious dose is right around 10 cells. So the infectious dose is the number of individual cells you typically need for an, an infection to establish itself. A lot of times this is measured in like the hundreds of thousands or in the case of cholera in the millions of cells needed to cause an infection. For uh, Francisella tularensis, it's like 10 you don't need to be exposed to much to get a full-blown infection. So the way you get this is either through ingesting infected meat um, or handling of infected tissues. Um, rabbits are one of the species that very often carry this disease. And as a result, this the sort of a colloquial nickname for this is rabbit fever because people who handle rabbits, grow rabbits, um, have an increased rate of infection with this. Uh, you can also get it from the bite of an infected arthropod, such as a dog tick, the lone star tick, wood ticks, deer uh, and deer flies you can spread this as well, but it's, it's not as, as common. There is no prevention for this. So there's no vaccination and the treatment is with antibiotics. Now, um, this is, this is a scary disease. This is one of those things where if you get diagnosed with this, you get to be in a room kind of by yourself in your own little wing of the hospital because this is not something that we want spreading, especially if it spreads very easily. Um, and it is potentially fatal, uh, especially if it gets into the lungs. So if it gets into the lungs, there's a 30 to 60% mortality rate associated with tularemia. This is also, I'll just note uh, for the people who are curious, this is also one of those diseases that's um, labeled as a potential uh, bioterrorist threat. And that really comes out of the fact that its infectious dose is so low um, that it could be fairly easy to put a small amount of that onto something uh, and, and uh, weaponize it. Uh, as far as I know, there are no documented cases of that, but it's definitely one of those that's sort of on that sort of like bioterrorist watch list. Okay, moving on to brucellosis. So brucellosis is named after the brucella species that cause it. Uh, so in that species is kind of specific to 
what its host species is. So for example, with cattle and buffalo, it's Brucella abortus. For dogs, it's Brucella canis. For uh, for pigs, it's uh, Brucella suis. And for goat sheeping in, in camels, it's Brucella melitensis. All right. So uh, any one of these species manifests the same disease. Uh, it is a gram negative intracellular bacterium. And it in the 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 pattern of this is the way the disease sort of manifests is a bit interesting. Um, it's a bit like malaria, which we're going to meet in a few minutes, where you get this pattern of undulating fever, and that's because of the way the cells kind of go through these stages of like being in high numbers and then being in low numbers, being in high numbers, being in low numbers, and with that undulation of the fever, you get that undulation of the chills, the sweats, and the headache. Um, but throughout, you're going to experience fatigue, weakness, joint muscle pain, loss of appetite as a result. Um, the thing that you need to do to diagnose this is a blood culture. But here's the thing. Because the fever corresponds to levels of bacteria in the bloodstream, usually you want those blood cultures to be taken during one of the fever stages. So while they have those big signs and symptoms, that's when you want to take it because you'll have the highest number of brucella species in the bloodstream, making them easier to detect. Now, the way you get this is contact with infected fluids and tissues. A very, very common way to get this is through the consumption of unpasteurized dairy products. And one of the things that I have been noting over the past couple of years is there's this big movement uh, to consume raw milk. And, uh, and that's not legal. And uh, as far as I know, it's not legal anywhere in the United States, but it appears that some states have sort of or they're either not really enforcing that policy or or whatever. I, I can't stress enough how how dangerous unpasteurized dairy products can be. Um, and this is one of those diseases that fairly rapidly spreads through the consumption of these and in some cases uh, is fatal, uh, as, we'll, as we'll learn in just a few seconds. Um, you can also get it through inhaling the bacteria. So if you're... Um, you know, if, if, if your dog is infected or pigs are infected or things like that, um, you know, it's very easy to sort of inhale these bacteria at times um, and consuming raw contaminated meat. Again, you need to be careful and making sure that you're drinking pasteurized milk and eating properly cooked food. Otherwise, you are at risk for this particular infection. There's no prevention for it. Uh, treatment, antibiotics. So some complications. Chronic blues, uh, brucellosis is one. There are some people whose body just doesn't get rid of this well and you're kind of just going through these recurring bouts of this really debilitating disease. Uh, it can also go to the heart, which is potentially fatal, uh, potential fatal, potentially fatal form of endocarditis. Um, meningitis or encephalitis are also potentially fatal as a result. And something called hepatosplenal megaly, which is a swelling of the liver and the spleen, which can be painful and reduce the ability of these organs to function. So uh, overall, not a very good, uh, not a very good disease to get. Um, and really, uh, being careful about what you're eating and how you're preparing your food is a great way to prevent this. Uh, this particular infection isn't really one that we worry too, too much about, um, but is is more common than people think. So uh, I, I've, I've literally had people tell me that cat scratch fever is a made up disease. And I think that's because Ted Nugent wrote a song called Cat Scratch Fever back in the 70s. And it's actually a real thing. Um, it's caused by a bacterium called Bartonella hensleyi, uh, and this is another gram-negative intracellular bacterium. And basically, uh, if a cat has this, whether it's, um, usually what happens is a cat either bites you or scratches you, and as a result, they either have this either on their claws or in their fur, and then the bacteria gains access uh, to your body that way. Things you're going to notice, pus-filled nodules near the wound, swollen, painful lymph nodes, fever, chills, and fatigue, hence cat scratch fever, the fever. Um, diagnosis is usually symptomatic. So I, I got bit by a cat, I got scratched by a cat, and now I have this. Yep. Uh, and that's how it gets through. Uh, cat scratches or bites. There's no prevention for this, but if you do get scratched or bitten by a cat, it's not a bad idea to wash your hands, even if it's your cat, particularly if your cat is an outdoor cat. You don't know what they're getting into because uh, they get into it with other cats who could have this and then it spreads to them. So you need to be careful about that. Treatment is antibiotics, but it's not always necessary. This often can resolve on its own. But if somebody is immunocompromised, um, it's important that um, 
we take care of this uh, because there are some things that can happen. So there's something called bacillary angioma, uh, angiomatosis, where you get these clusters of like blood vessels uh, as a result of the infection, or you can end up with bacill uh, bacillary paleosis, which is you get these like cyst like masses on your internal organs. And these can be kind of painful and, and, and hurt as well. So, uh, you know, if you have a cat, you like cats, uh, you know, just be aware uh, they scratch you. This is something that you might potentially get. Um, perhaps the best known systemic infection in the history of humankind, uh, is the plague. Uh, and that's because it took out about a third of the world's population sometime back in the, uh, middle ages. So, uh, it is caught it, first off, one of the things I like to dispel the plague still exists. You can't still get the plague people. A lot of people did die from it back in like the 13, 14, 1500s, but also the plague is still real and you can still get it even in the United States. Um, the causative agent for this is a gram negative rod, uh, called Yersinia pestis. And, um, there are three sort of different variations of this disease and then the signs and symptoms match accordingly. So, uh, the one that people are probably most familiar with are, is the bubonic plague. And this is characterized by the presence of swollen, uh, uh swollen lymph nodes, uh, that turn like purple or black in color. And these are called buboes. So that's where the term bubonic plague comes from. As a result of this, high fever, headache, low blood pressure, and chills. You're heading into uh, septic shock as a result of this. This is It actually lives inside the lymphatic system, but you get that same, and then it eventually goes into the bloodstream, and you get that same sort of response that we talked about with septic shock, where you get that um, sort of like overwhelming burst of like cytokines and all that kind of stuff. Um, the pneumonic plague is what happens if it gains access into the lungs. So you get a rapidly developing, uh, form of pneumonia and then a cough that produces bloody sputum as a result, because it's, it's quite literally damaging the blood cells in there. And then there's septicemic plague, fever, chills, extreme weakness, and septic shock. And this is where it kind of skips the lymph node all together and just goes right into the bloodstream. Um, so diagnosis, whatever you got, whether it's bloody sputum, whether it's a bubo, whatever it happens to be. Or, or you think it's in the bloodstream, grab a culture and you're going to see Yersinia pestis. You can see that right here uh, in there. Um, and you will see that. So how do you get this? Well, it depends. The bubonic plague is spread through flea bites uh, from an infected, uh, an infected flea. Okay. But you can also spread this to people in an aerosolized form, which is what's going to cause the pneumonic plague. Um, and, uh, and septicemic shock is usually when you directly introduce the bacterium into the bloodstream. So I imagine this would have to be through like a needle stick or something like that. There's no prevention for this, but you can treat it with antibiotics. Uh, the one thing to note is um, the fatality rates for these particular forms of plague vary. Uh, and they absolutely vary based on whether antibiotics get involved or not. So the bubonic plague, without antibiotic intervention, it's got a 55% mortality rate. With antibiotics, it's still around 10%, uh, which is a pretty good outcome, right? 10%. Nine out of 10 people will survive the plague as long as they get to the hospital, the bubonic plague, as long as they get to the hospital and get antibiotics. The pneumonic plague and the septicemic plague, if left untreated, you're dead. 100% fatality rate, you're not surviving it. And even with appropriate medical interventions, it's still a coin flip. 50-50 for the survival rate uh, of the pneumonic and septicemic plague, even with uh, medical interventions. Again, that doesn't mean we don't try. It's interesting. I've had students try to tell me on exams and other ways that like, well, you got the plague, you're just, you're done. That's not true at all. It's, it is treatable. Obviously, the earlier you get to it, the better. Um, but it is scary to know that even if you do get an infection, uh, if you do get pneumonic or septicemic plague, it's a coin flip, whether the antibiotics will actually work or not, which is, which is kind of crazy. Okay, here's a disease uh, that I don't know a lot of people know about. Um, I don't encounter a lot of, of my students or people in general that think about typhus much. Uh, this is actually caused by a gram-negative intracellular bacterium called Rickettsia prowazekii. Um, and uh, we'll meet uh, another Rickettsia species in just a moment when we talk about Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, Rickettsias are always gram-negative intracellular bacteria. One thing that's kind of interesting, if you're from a, if you're a biologist like me, uh, the genus Rickettsii, not this species in particular, but the genus Rickettsia, they're the closest living relatives we have to whatever ancestral species gave rise to mitochondria uh, in all eukaryotic cells. So we kind of have like a weird sort of like evolutionarily evolutionary relationship to rickettsia species just sort of a tangent but i do think it's interesting um 
Signs and symptoms, high fever, body aches, and a rash. So typhus does cause a rash, which helps to separate it from some other infectious diseases. Um, and the diagnosis is using either PCR or immunofluorescence technology to detect these bacteria. Uh, transmission is actually from lice, in particular, pediculus humanus, um, which is normal body lice that we find in humans. And there's no prevention for this, but the treatment is antibiotics. This actually spreads very, very rapidly in places where sanitation is poor. Notably, battlefields. Um, if you read up uh, historically about um, some of the major wars that happened in like the later half of the 19th century, uh, middle to later half of the 19th century, things like the American Civil War, um, the Spanish-American War, uh, the Crimean War, the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s, um, World War I, even World War II, they were massive, massive ty typhus outbreaks um, that took out huge numbers of soldiers um, because this is a very potentially fatal illness. Um, and when you have all, when you have that poor sanitation, lice is a common occurrence. And then the lice just spread this from one person to the next treatment is with antibiotics. And again, I noted these were in the, you know, the eight, you know, the, the 19th, early 20th century before we had antibiotics. And now that it was a lot less of a deal in world war two than it was in world war one, because by the time we got to world war two, we did have some medical interventions that could help treat this. Complications, sepsis, so if it gets in the bloodstream, that's potentially fatal, and there's also the possibility for it to either damage the heart or the brain, and both of those are also potentially fatal as well. So typhus, very not good, and it can spread uh, very rapidly through, uh, through those lice. So as I mentioned, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is another infectious disease caused by a rickettsia species. So this, in this case, it's rickettsia rickettsii. The name's so nice, you have to say it twice. Uh, again, another gram-negative intracellular bacterium. Uh, and then the early signs and symptoms of this are going to be a high fever, headache, body aches, nausea, and vomiting. Then later on, in somewhere between 35 and 60% of patients, you'll get this petechial rash that you see here. Um, this is one of those diseases where... You got to catch it early. Uh, if you catch it early, um, the treatment is usually effective. But if you catch it too late, uh, RMSF can be fatal. So diagnosis is symptomatic. Um, you see these signs, you get these signs and symptoms. You got it, you know, a documented, uh, you, you know, you get a documented tick bite. And you start to see these signs and symptoms. You, you probably know what you're dealing with. But you can also do fluorescence antibody staining of the rash of a biopsy of the rash, you can also do PCR. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is spread through tick bites. Uh, the three most common species we find are gonna be the American dog tick, uh, the Rocky Mountain wood tick, and brown tick or brown dog ticks. And I've, I've got pictures of a, a couple of these here so you know what you're dealing with. Again, ticks just no good. Um, <laughs> they just, you know, if it weren't for the fact that they spread bloodborne illnesses, I don't think we'd mind them as much. Uh, they'd just be pests, but man, it seems like they're always bringing something bad with them. Uh, prevention, none. Uh, treatments with antibiotics. Uh, things to note, in about 3% of cases, even with treatment, RMSF is fatal. Uh, and this is usually the result of low blood pressure followed by cardiac arrest. We're looking at a, a sepsis situation here as well. Another tick-borne illness uh, that's very common in my neck of the woods uh, over on the East Coast um, is Lyme disease. And again, I'm going to stress this. This is not Lyme's disease. It's not named after a guy named Billy Lyme. Uh, it's named after actually a town in Connecticut called Lyme, Connecticut, spelled with a Y, um, where this disease was really first isolated and described. Uh, it is caused by a spirochete in this case called Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, you can see this is, um, this is some immunofluorescence staining of these guys. Um, and uh, the signs and symptoms vary. This is a disease that has different stages, as with most spirochete, uh, spirochete-borne diseases. Early on, you're going to notice something called erythema migrans, which is also known as the bullseye rash. And this is shown right here in this picture in A. This happens in 70%, 70 to 80% of cases. So three quarters to, 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 to four fifths of all cases are going to have this happen. That does mean that in about 20, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30% of cases, you don't get this. The other thing is it depends on where you've get bit, where you got bit. You may not even notice this rash exists. So if it's in your hair, you're not going to see this. Um, if it's in a part of the body that you don't readily observe, you might not see this. Um, and along with that, you're going to get flu-like symptoms. 
Over the span of a few weeks, we're going to go from the early localized symptoms to the early disseminated symptoms. Severe headache, stiff neck. You can end up with things like facial paralysis, arthritis, carditis. Uh, these are problems. Um, then if it's still left untreated later on, you may end up with severe arthritis. It can even spread and cause meningitis or encephalitis and altered mental states. So the damage that these spirochetes can do is immense uh, if, if the disease isn't recognized, diagnosed, and treated appropriately. Uh, diagnosis, symptom, like if you walk into a doctor's office and you have this, we're done. End of conversation. You have Lyme disease and they're going to treat it immediately, okay? Uh, if this never appears or if you miss this and it's now too late, now we have to start doing things like ELISA's to detect anti uh, Borrelia antibodies in your bloodstream or immunofluorescence to see if we can detect these guys. But again, they have to be in high, like in a large enough presence to be, uh, to be noticed. Uh, these are spread through, uh, what are often referred to as black legged ticks. Um, and the, in the Eastern United States, we have Ixodes scapularis. We commonly call this the deer tick. Uh, and then Ixodes pacificus in, in the Western portion of the United States. Um, Prevention is none. Um, you know, in my area, all summer long, you just hear people, you know, wear long pants if you're going in the woods. Make sure you're wearing bug spray containing DEET to keep these guys off of you. But uh, there's no vaccination against it or anything like that. Uh, there is for pets, by the way. I will note, you can get your dog vaccinated against Lyme disease, uh, but we don't have one that we give to people. Treatment is with antibiotics. Uh, and then complications, uh, this is fatal. If left untreated, it can be. Uh, and the other problem is, is uh, the lifelong sequelae that are associated with this. And just a reminder, the term sequelae refers to um, like signs and symptoms of a disease that remain after the disease has been treated and cured. Uh, so if this damages your, your blood, your nervous system, if this damages certain tissues, they may never recover. Um, so you might end up with lifelong pain or lifelong uh, damage to tissues um, as a result of this infection, even if it's properly treated. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, we're done talking about the bacterial infections, and we're going to move on to talk about the viral infections of the circulatory and lymphatic systems. So uh, one of the more prevalent ones, uh, I would joke about this, when I was in college, um, there was only two diagnoses that you could get at the health center. You were either pregnant or you had mono. This seemed to be <laughs> whenever you went there, no matter how you felt, like you have mono. Oh, okay, you're pregnant. Oh, okay, uh, that seemed to be healthy. We're willing to do, but uh, hopefully that's improved since I've been gone. Uh, but infectious mononucleosis is a very common illness, particularly in uh, school-aged people. Uh, spreads like wildfire in college dorms. Uh, this is caused by a virus known as the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and signs and symptoms of this are pharyngitis, so uh, you know that swelling in the throat, fever. Uh, you can get some very pronounced lymph node swelling. This poor young man has. Uh, has that going on here, hepatosplenomegaly, so that's a swelling of the spleen and the liver. Uh, but the big one, the thing that people really notice is the extreme fatigue. Uh, people with cases of mononucleosis, um, you know, this we, we used to refer to this as being a semester killer. If you get this, you're not going to class for like a month, maybe two. I, I knew multiple people uh, when I was in college that got mono and they just that was the end of that semester. They would take a medical withdrawal and they would come back the next year after the next semester after they'd recovered. Um, diagnosis, the clinical signs and symptoms are usually a strong indicator of what's going on here. But they have developed a, uh, a rapid monospot test that can give you um, a pretty quick diagnosis of whether or not mono is implicated. This spreads in institutional settings or settings like uh, dorms because it's so easily spread through contact with bodily fluids. Once somebody gets it, um, it's usually a matter of time before other people are getting it. There's no prevention for it and this, uh, the treatment for it is symptomatic. Um, you know, you can get these swollen lymph nodes can come with pain. The hepatosplenomegaly is a, is a problem as well. Um, it is painful and people are just exhausted when they have it. Uh, so usually you're just sleeping and trying to recover. Uh, complications. So one of the major complications is this is increased the people that get infectious mononucleosis have an increased risk of developing a particularly, a particular type of non Hodgkin's lymphoma called Burkitt lymphoma, which if diagnosed very early on is, is fairly easily true, uh, treatable. Uh, when you have this, you end up with, uh, solid tumors of malignant B cells. So you have these cancerous B cells that like clump together and form tumors. And this typically only occurs in people that are immunocompromised. Uh, the other thing that I don't have listed on here, but I will note, if you're diagnosed with mononucleosis, 
uh, you are typically pulled out of any type of contact sport for a significant period of time until you fully recovered. And that's actually due to the hepatosplenomegaly. With these organs being swollen the way they are, there's a real chance that you could crack these things or damage these things uh, and cause like internal bleeding. So um, I mentioned, you know, I knew people in college, I got this, I, I had at least one member of my, uh, I played collegiate baseball and one member of my team, like missed an entire season because they got diagnosed with mono really early on in the season. And, uh, the doctors basically said like, he's, he, he can't play, uh, because if he, you know, if that, if he does have that hepatosplenomegaly and he gets hit, uh, by a ball or sliding something, he, he they, they could cause internal bleeding and die. So, uh, they're just pulled right out. So, you know, just things to keep in mind. Um, you know, if, if you were to ever get this or someone, you know, gets this, um, another, in, uh, viral infection, uh, of, uh, systemic viral infection is the cytomegalovirus, um, which is just a, an interesting name. It's, it's named after that because it causes cells to get really, really big cytomegalo cell big. Um, and this is, uh, a very common, um, this, so the signs and symptoms, uh, basically this is going to appear very similar to mononucleosis, but not be caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and many people who get this infection are actually asymptomatic, and this can actually be problematic as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, diagnosis, microscopy to look for these sort of giant enlarged cells. Um, PCR, also an enzyme amino assay, uh, can be used. EIA is what it's often abbreviated as. And you get this through contact with bodily fluids. Now back to that sort of asymptomatic infection. If mom has an asymptomatic CMV infection, she can then pass it on to the baby, uh, during birth, basically, uh, during, during the birthing process, we call this vertical transmission. Uh, also, it's very, very common with blood transfusion and kidney transplants. I read one particular statistic that said something like 80% of all people who get a kidney transplant may end up developing uh, a CMV infection. It's a, it's a pretty crazy high number uh, for people that get that. Uh, there is no prevention for it. There's no vaccine out there right now. And the main reason why is it doesn't really seem to cause severe damage in most people. Uh, as you see, there, there can be some issues. Uh, treatment is symptomatic if mild. Um, if there is a severe infection, then they'll use antivirals uh, to help fight back. Um, the perinatal infections, the ones that happen around birth, can be very serious. Um, and this could cause um, uh, uh, growth or, uh, or, or uh, growth deficits, uh, or or effect, uh, mental deficits. Uh, jaundice, deafness is actually quite common. Blindness is actually something that can happen. Um, we also worry about those immunocompromised patients. Uh, they can develop liver damage. Uh, it can cause transplant rejection and death. Uh, and then people who have AIDS often develop uh, encephalitis or progressive rhinitis, which can cause blindness. So again, what you're seeing is with CMV, it's not really a big deal unless you're immunocompromised in some way, uh, and that can cause issues. Okay, so let's move on to yellow fever. So yellow fever is spread by the yellow fever virus. Um, I'm hoping all of you are recognizing that for a lot of these, it's pretty simple, right? It's just name the disease, what's the virus? Uh, so signs and symptoms, many people who develop or who get infected with yellow fever virus are asymptomatic, but uh, this is one of those diseases we don't hear about much more, but was actually a real problem, um, you know, 100 years ago or so. Or so. Mild symptoms of the disease include dizziness, fever, chills, headache, and myalgia, so just generalized pain. Um, but in some cases, people develop severe infections, and this is going to result in flushing of the face, nausea, vomiting, severe fatigue, restlessness, and irritability are, are very common signs. And you can see this little infographic does a nice job. And that yellow discoloration of the skin and the whites of the eyes, um, hence the term yellow fever. All right. Uh, diagnosis, uh, usually clinical. Uh, clinical based on signs and symptoms. This is spread through mosquito bites. So this is one of those mosquito borne illnesses. And there actually is a yellow fever vaccine. Um, this is not a vaccine that uh, we we give out in the United States uh, because we don't, basically yellow fever kind of doesn't exist in our country anymore because of uh, mosquito eradication programs that have basically gotten that out. Um, but there are other countries where yellow fever still continues to be an issue and they do have vaccine for it. Treatment is symptomatic. Um, and the complications in about seven and a half percent of cases, it's fatal, uh, because there's really no antiviral treatment that's effective against it. So 
we just try to prevent it in places where it exists and where it doesn't exist. We we don't worry about it. Dengue fever is another one of uh, is a, is actually a pretty terrifying disease. Um, it kind of goes up there with uh, with Ebola in some ways. Um, so dengue fever is caused by the dengue fever virus. Uh, and it results in a, an incredibly high fever. So we're looking in that like 104 plus range uh, of fever, intense headaches. Um, and then this is a hemorrhagic, uh, a hemorrhagic disease. So you're going to get a rash and then they'll be bleeding from the nose and gums, extreme muscle joint and bone pain, uh, as this is happening as well. So this is, uh, really problematic, uh, diagnosis, serology, ELISA, RT, PCR are all ways that we can do this. Um, transmission, this is a, this is a mosquito borne illness. You get bit by a mosquito that carries the virus and then you got it. Um, prevention, none. And the treatment is symptomatic. Now, one of the things that to note about dengue fever, this is a disease where, where clinical interventions matter. About 30% of people who develop dengue fever will die if they don't receive supportive treatment. If proper supportive care is provided, it drops to less than 1%. So you can see the the value uh, that uh, medical interventions have for this particular illness. Another hemorrhagic fever uh, that is less severe is chikungunya. So chikungunya is caused by the chikungunya virus. Uh, again, you get that high fever, that 104. You're going to get joint pain, rash, and blisters. But uh, this is one of those that, while it's awful, and people have talked about their experience with dis this disease. Um, there are people, people literally describe this feeling like you're on fire. It feels like your body's on fire for like a week. So it's quite miserable uh, if you get it. The good news is, is it's not fatal. It's not a fatal disease. You're not going to die from chikungunya. Diagnosis, serology, ELISA, RT-PCR, basically the same for, for dengue fever. Spread through mosquito bites the same way. There is no prevention for it. And the treatment, again, is symptomatic. But uh, hope you don't get this. It's It's supposed to be just the worst <laughs> in terms of pain. The good news is you're not going to die. You might just wish you were going to die for a little while because of how painful it is. Uh, Ebola. Uh, so Ebola is something that I think has really come more to the forefront because about a decade ago, there was this Ebola outbreak um, in Africa. And then we actually ended up with a number of people in the United States who developed Ebola. And there was this big panic that we were going to end up with this Ebola outbreak. So it was like the pre-pandemic fear of the pandemic was Ebola. Um, so this is caused by, uh, by Ebola virus. Um, and this is a disease that has uh, various stages. So uh, early on, fever, headache, myalgia, so like pain, uh, cough, chest pain, pharyngitis. Then later on, you get the abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting. And this is another one of those hemorrhagic fevers. And um, you end up with hemorrhaging from the GI tract, skin, and other sites. And um, if you ever want to look, I, I didn't include them in here because they're, they're kind of brutal. But um, looking at pictures of this, you, people are bleeding out of their ears, their nose, their mouth. It just sort of turns your body into a leaky, bloody mess when you get this. Um, the diagnosis, uh, is ELISA and PCR, and you get this through direct contact with infected fluids. Um, there is an Ebola strain, an Ebola vaccine that was developed, uh, in the United States during this outbreak that is at least effective against some strains of the Ebola virus, but not all the treatment for this is symptomatic, but even with symptomatic treatment, um, 50 to 90% of the cases do result in the death of the patient, which is, um, it's pretty off the charts. It's pretty high. Um, Hantavirus uh, is, uh, is an interesting disease that is uh, spread uh, through aerosolized rodent urine and feces. Um, so Hantavirus results in fever, myalgia, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. But the thing that we're actually looking at is um, the people that are most affected by the hantavirus are the result of pulmonary signs and symptoms. So you get this rapidly developing pulmonary edema, uh, which is where you end up with fluid in the lungs, like in some cases referred to as flashing, where they go from like nothing to just can't breathe and almost dead or dying immediately. Uh, this also results in hypotension, so low blood pressure. This is shock. Uh, so this results in pneumonia, shock, and death. And it can happen in a matter of hours uh, when it does happen. 
um, diagnosis, Eliza Western blotter, RT-PCR. Um, and oh, I accidentally left the wrong prevention here. So this should read none. There's no uh, prevention for this whatsoever. Um, I, I just meant to delete that. Uh, the treatment here is symptomatic and the complications in about 50% of cases, the people infected through this are actually going to die. So quick note, pause the recording just so I could make that change. So now you know, there's no prevention for hantavirus. I mistakenly left that on the slide when I, when I made it. So there's your update in live time. Okay, moving on to HIV. So HIV, a lot of people don't know, there's actually two strains of, of HIV. There's HIV-1 and HIV-2. Um, in the United States, HIV-1 is the only one that, uh, that is documented here, uh, but both exist in, on the continent of Africa. Um, so HIV infection goes in a few stages. Uh, so there's stage one, which is acute HIV infection, flu-like illness that lasts a few weeks. Uh, during this time period, you are incredibly contagious. So if you, because, um, the virus is really kind of at its highest levels in, in your bloodstream. Um, at this stage, and you'll see that this is what we're monitoring is the, are these CD4 positive cells. If you're curious what CD4 is, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a receptor that's on the surface of a select group of, of your blood cells, of your white blood cells. Uh, and this is really what we monitor. So at this stage, uh, there really won't be an impact on those CD4 positive cells because it's the beginning of the infection. So you'll have at least 500 CD4 positive uh, cells per microliter. Um, then your body kind of recognizes there an inf there's an infection and it begins to fight back. And at that rate, your viral load begins to drop, but it's going to start causing damage to those CD4 positive cells. And as a result, you're going to start seeing those levels drop. And um, that clinical latency, as long as that CD4 positive cell count is anywhere between 200 and 499 cells per microliter or better, um, you're okay. Um, and you will not notice any other signs and symptoms at this stage. And the big thing here is as long as we keep that CD4 positive cell count there with proper treatment, people can remain in this stage for the remainder of their life. And, you know, as a, as a, per a person of a certain age, um, at, at the time of this recording, I'm, I'm 41 years old. Um, you know, I've lived through the nineties, uh, when we were being taught about HIV. Um, and if you weren't there, I can tell you, this was terrifying. Um, there was this new disease that developed in the 80s. People were talking about it. Um, there really was no way to observe this. There were no treatments out there. Um, if, you, if you got HIV, it was only a matter of time before you made it into stage three, which is AIDS. And then it was a matter of weeks to months before you die. Um, so it's very remarkable at this stage in my life where we can look at HIV infection as sort of being a chronic condition and not entirely fatal. Um, but I think it's important to realize that this only works with proper medical intervention. Uh, so it's critically important that people who do have HIV do have access to their medications because it's quite literally the difference between their life and their death. So, um, you know, it's great that we have medical interventions that can keep people from dying of this disease. Um, but it's also critically important that people maintain access to these drugs um, because without that, they will go into stage three, which is AIDS. Um, and in this case, the, the, the key diagnosis here is the, the key finding is that the CD4 positive cells are now below 200 cells per microliter. Um, the other thing to note is there are things called AIDS defining illnesses or ADIs that once you develop one of these things like, um, like Capone, uh, Kaposi sarcoma, for example, or some other infections uh, that can also sort of be a, a hallmark of that transition into AIDS. And at this point, uh, chills, fevers, sweats, swollen lymph glands, weakness, and weight loss. At this per at this point, the person's immune system is is essentially no longer functioning appropriately, and even things that wouldn't cause issues in normal people are going to cause issues. Um, diagnosis. So the primary diagnosis is usually through serological tests. There's some fairly quick tests that you can do. Uh, and then they're going to confirm those using either Western blot or PCR, which are relying on the, the detection of direct detection of, uh, HIV proteins or, uh, PCR to look for the, the HIV nucleic acids. Um, Transmission is contact with bodily fluids. So this is blood and, and semen, uh, but not saliva. This is not something that's spread that way. Um, there is no vaccine for HIV right now, but 
Uh, one of the things we we do have available now that we didn't in the past is something called PrEP. So this is prophylactic antiviral therapy. And what we do know is that people who are not infected with HIV that are on this PrEP program have very, very, very little chance of acquiring um, HIV even from an infected person or con sexual contact with an infected person. So um, this is something that's available to people who are in a that are at high risk for for contracting HIV. Um, people, for example, who have partners who are HIV positive can go on PrEP and that greatly reduces the chances of them being able to acquire that from their partner. Treatment for this is uh, a specific cocktail of antiretroviral therapy. Um, and the complications, once you develop AIDS, it's fatal. Uh, so what this graph is showing here, I just wanna just walk you through this real quick. Um, you've got a couple of things going on here. In blue, what we're looking at is the CD4 positive lymphocyte count. And you can see during the primary infection, uh, um, it's still very high and then it drops down into that range here. And then we get into that latent period um, here where it stays between like 200 and 500 at this point. Um, and again, this could be indefinitely, right? Um, but then what happens is uh, over time, you if, if left untreated or the treatment is unsuccessful, you start to see that CD4 level plummet. And at the same time, this red graph here, this red line is showing you the viral load. So you can see early on in the infection, high viral load. And this is why it's so, um, so contagious at this point. But then it drops and it gets held in check by your body's immune system. And then hopefully a combination of the immune system plus drugs to keep you in this latent phase. And then as that CD4 positive T cell count drops, up goes the viral load. Uh, so a couple of things you're gonna be monitoring in any of your HIV patients, or if you have HIV, things that they're monitoring on you are gonna be, what is your CD4 positive cell count? How's your immune system doing versus what's that viral load? Is your body able to keep your viral load down? And there are cases where um, with proper antiretroviral therapy, um, this viral load could basically be undetectable, um, meaning you, you do still have HIV, but it's so low that we literally can't detect the virus in your bloodstream. And um, at that point, your, your body, as far as it's concerned, is just normal and healthy. You are still able to spread the virus, even if your viral count is undetectable. It is still possible to spread the virus. So that doesn't mean you have like carte blanche, uh, but it's just important to note that you know we can control this disease as long as we use proper medical interventions. Okay, so moving on to parasitic infections of the circulatory and lymphatic systems. Uh, one of the most common infectious diseases on the planet Earth is malaria. Every year, hundreds of millions of people are infected with plasmodium species, uh, which are a group of protozoans that infect uh, your body. So what you're looking at here, these are right stained red blood cells and these little ring things, you're seeing the little structures in there. Those are your, uh, those are the malaria protozoans. Those are the plasmodium. Um, what you get here are these extreme cycles of fever and chills. So uh, you can kind of see how this works here uh, on this chart. But, you know, the liver cell gets infected. The plasmodium multiplies and enters the bloodstream. It affects those red blood cells. And when it lyses those red blood cells, that's when you get the signs and symptoms. You get that you get that fever and you get that chill. And then it goes back into the liver and kind of restarts the cycle. And that's why this pattern undulates. Every When it's in the liver, you don't notice the signs and symptoms. When it goes into the bloodstream and ruptures those red blood cells, it, it, that's when you get the signs and symptoms. Uh, usually begin with malaise, so this general feeling of like illness. Then you'll get abrupt chills, fever, and then you can get a rapid pulse, um, headache, myalgia, so just pain, nausea, and vomiting. Diagnosis, you do blood smears and you look for these ringed trophozoites in there. This is spread through mosquitoes. Uh, there is no prevention for it. Um, and treatment is with anti-malarial drugs. Um, and this is potentially fatal. Uh, it was interesting. I had a student in my class a few years ago who was from Africa. And, uh, you know, he, he, he did us the favor of talking a bit about his experiences with malaria. And he's like, yeah, I've had it a couple of times. And pretty much you just get it. Uh, in a lot of places, they kind of treat it like the flu. Uh, you know, you get it, it sucks, you feel lousy for a while, and then you get better. And in some cases, people don't. And that's the reality uh, for billions of people on the planet Earth, uh, that malaria is just a fact of life. And you might get it, and you might die. Um, so uh, it's crazy when you think about it. It's crazy. But uh, that is the reality. So toxoplasmosis is another one of these parasitic infections. It's caused by a protozoan called Toxoplasma gandii. Um, now, a lot of people who are infected 
with Toxoplasma gondii have no signs or symptoms. If you do, it's often similar to mononucleosis, so that like fatigue and and, and that kind of stuff. Um, now, what these do is they kind of form these cysts. Uh, so when you take tissue samples from infected people, you'll see these tissue cysts, and that'll give you an idea of what they what they've gotten. Um, so transmission of this is usually through infected cat feces. Uh, it can be in their litter, it can be on their fur, uh, that kind of stuff. Now, uh, this is one of those reasons. So when women get pregnant, um, they are often cautioned against continuing to change the cat litter and things like that. Uh, because there's a very real risk of this disease being spread to them. Uh, and this can actually cross the placental barrier and cause fetal abnormalities, premature birth, or miscarriage. Uh, so an infected mother has about a one in three chance of having this happen. Uh, so what that means basically is, um, you know, if you are carrying a baby, avoiding cat feces is a great idea uh, because there's a possibility that you can get it from there. Um, in terms of prevention, there is none. Treatment is with antiparasitics. All right. So again, there really isn't a lot to worry about unless you are severely immunocompromised or pregnant. Uh, other than that, you're probably going to be fine. Uh, and even if you do end up with an infection, you probably won't even notice it uh, with your signs and symptoms. Babesiosis is another one that often shows up. Um, there are lots of species of Babesia that can cause this. One of the most common is, is Babesia microti. Um, and the signs and symptoms of this include uh, high fever, hemolytic anemia, because of what it does to the blood cells. You can see here are more blood cells. A lot looks a lot like malaria, right? But these are the Babesia parasites. Um, one of the diagnoses, and you can't see it that well here, you might see it a bit here, is there's a bit of a Maltese cross pattern that happens um, uh, inside of these cells uh, to help diagnose that. Um, but it can also lead to jaundice and renal failure uh, as a result as well. Diagnosis, you do the blood smears. You're looking for these parasites in the bloodstream, and the transmission is with a tick bite. So quite often, um, the ticks that carry these are the same ticks that carry Lyme disease, which we met earlier on in this particular video. Um, and last I checked, the co-infection rate is about 20%. So in about one in five cases where you have Lyme disease, you also see babesiosis as a result because the same ticks are, are spreading the disease. No prevention for it. Treatment with this is antibiotics or antimalarials. Again, we're looking at the same kind of, it's a different species for sure, but it's a protozoan infection of the red blood cells. And as a result, the antimalarials seem to be effective. And it is potentially fatal, uh, depending on how much damage this particular disease does. Uh, Chagas disease. So Chagas disease is a bloodborne illness spread by um, the or caused by the protozoan Trypanosoma cruzi. Um, signs and symptoms include fever, headache, myalgia, rash, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, that hepatosplenomegaly again and swollen lymph nodes. Uh, but one of the dead giveaway signs is called the Romagna sign. So where that bite happens uh, is uh, where you're going to see that swelling. Um, diagnosis is microscopy, serology, and PCR. This is spread by a group of bugs called triatamine bugs. They're also known as kissing bugs or assassin bugs. They're known as the kissing bug because they overwhelmingly seem to bite on the face or the neck. Uh, so it's like they're kissing you. Now, the bite is completely painless. Um, but what you'll start to notice then is that localized swelling that occurs. That's that Romagna sign that we're talking about. Uh, there is no prevention for this. Treatment is with antiparasitics. Um, and this can cause irreversible damage to the heart or brain, uh, which can be fatal or long or, or permanent. Um, and then you can also end up with a chronic infection. And people who are chronically infected with this uh, it's a debilitating disease. I mean, just imagine living with these signs and symptoms the rest of your life. Uh, and that's what can happen in some cases. A few more to go, and then we'll be done uh, with this particular video. Uh, uh, the next protozoan uh, infectious disease we'll talk about is leishmania or leishmaniasis. I'm sorry. This is spread by uh, leishmania species. Um, when I say, again, when I say species, I'm just, there's lots of different members of this particular genus. Um, 
it comes in three different varieties. Uh, first is cutaneous. So if it's a cutaneous infection, you're often going to get these sores at the site of the bite. Uh, visceral happens when it gets deeper into the tissues. This is accompanied by a uh, fever, weight loss, that has paddosplenomegaly again. And then there are mucosal versions uh, where the lesions appear in your mucous membranes, like the inside of the mouth, uh, places like that. You can diagnose this by doing tissue species, I'm sorry, tissue smears to look for the leash, uh, leishmania here. Uh, and it's spread by sand flies. So this is a disease that's largely found in desert areas. We actually used to think this was restricted mainly to um, non, uh, we didn't think this was present in the United States. Let's put it that way. Uh, we usually thought this was more prevalent in areas like um, Central Asia, the Middle East, places like that. Uh, but there is a reservoir uh, of uh, leishmania species in the United States. So it is possible to get them mostly in those desert Southwest states like New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Nevada, um, some parts of Texas, California, things like that. Treatment is with antiparasitics uh, to get rid of that. Now, um, in many cases, uh, the resolution of this is, is pretty positive. Uh, however, uh, the fatality rate for visceral leishmaniasis is around 90% of it's left untreated. And the last one I have for you is uh, schistosomiasis, which is just a fun word to say, schistosomiasis. It's caused by uh, schistosoma species, which are a group of flatworms. Uh, these have a very complex life cycle uh, that involves snails, <laughs> uh, you know, sea snails, uh, and then they can end up getting into our body. So uh, the signs and symptoms early on, itchy, uh, a, a, a rash or itchy skin at the site of penetration, these actually enter through the skin, through skin penetration, uh, which is you, like, you step on one of these uh, snails or something like that, and then it gets into your body. Then fever, chills, cough, and myalgia. The reason why is those eggs are gonna start to make it into the tissues. And then because they're kind of lodged in there, we're not really the host that it wants to be. Um, these eggs become lodged in there and they start to hatch and stuff like that. And you get inflammation and scarring of the tissues, which is painful and not fun. Uh, you'll find the eggs in your patient's stool or urine samples. So that's how you're going to kind of diagnose this. Uh, the prevention for this is none. Um, and the treatment is antiparasitics. Uh, this isn't usually a fatal disease, um, but it does increase your risk for developing bladder cancer. Uh, that's one thing that we found. And in pregnant women, it does increase the rate of miscarriage. So um, that about wraps it up for this conversation about systemic infections. I know this is a bit of a long video, but there are lots of things that could potentially harm us uh, once it gets into the circulatory lymphatic systems. And again, I'll just reiterate what I said at the beginning. Once something makes it into these two systems, they largely have access to every other system in your body. And that's because the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels traffic your entire body. So... Okay, so I hope you have, uh, I hope you uh, learned a lot from this lecture and I will talk to you again th soon. Thanks for stopping by.